People ask me, Rafe, when did you first develop your obsession with words? Were both your parents linguists? Oh, no, I would reply. My mom was a hairdresser and dad, well, he never stayed at one thing very long. Though he could change a carburetor, rewire a freezer, or make mother feel like Cinderella when she tried on a new pair of shoes. Although they never had much money or a house of their own, their marriage lasted for over 50 contentious and loving years. My mom believed that I became interested in words because she watched a lot of Password on TV in the 60s when she was pregnant with me. Even when I was growing up, she would guess the best clues long before father ever did. I remembered how they once argued for hours over who gave a better clue for guessing the word lake. Michigan is not even a synonym for lake, dad insisted. It's just not. So what, mom replied. We live in Chicago. People would make the connection. Besides, why would the word bathtub make anyone think of the word lake? These arguments perhaps energized their relationship. But then the actor Betty White, a favorite participant on Password, said that game shows keep your mind sharp and plus are a good place to meet husbands. I was a slow starter as a reader, so for my ninth birthday, my parents gave me a book on famous explorers, and suddenly I wanted to be a discoverer of new worlds. I made a sail out of a blanket attached to an old hockey stick, and I was off on adventures around our living room. How about we go on a real adventure, my father suggested after I broke the TV antenna. This delayed watching Password until dad had time to fix it with a clothes hanger. We could go for a night hike and look for some comets, he suggested, and navigate by the stars. Mother immediately responded, I don't think that would be such a good idea, dear. Why not, I whined, because your father has no sense of direction. He can't even find a grocery store. After a moment, she added, hopefully, you could just join the Boy Scouts. But of course, I was too shy and father was too old. So we set out secretly by ourselves one night like Marco Polo or Lewis and Clark across the countryside. But the clouds rolled in, we lost our compass and we had to spend our darkest hours in a barn. <laughs> the dawn found us covered in mud and hay, hitchhiking back to our hotel and my very worried mother. We never saw any comets, but I learned that it, it isn't so much what you discovered that what was important, it was what you experienced during the search. And from that time on, reading for me became a form of exploration which is just as well since father and I were both grounded and forbidden to leave the backyard for a week. My fascination with words took a, a sudden boost when my fifth grade teacher explained homonyms, words that sound like other words but mean different things. Like squash, to press something flat but also referring to a fruit in shapes from acorn to zucchini. How could they all be called a squash? And then, there's the game of squash played in 18th century London pauper's prisons, but refined at the upper class Harrow School where some wealthy boys poked holes in a racquetball. Also it would take more interesting bounces off a wall. The same could be said for the history of words themselves that often took crazy bounces until you can't figure out how they ended up meaning what they do. That is if you could even trace who said them first. Well, almost like the Heisenberg uncertainty principle in physics, you could pinpoint the location of a particle or its speed, but not both at the same time. Although born Roman Catholic, my father was also restless when it came to religion. Eventually he settled on us becoming Unitarians. My mom, who was half Jewish, was very patient with his questing spirit. She just wanted me to feel at home wherever we might worship. 
Perhaps this led me to study at college both the history of religions and the history of science. Well, I didn't realize that this was the perfect training for a cosmologist, but there you are, another crazy bounce. In the beginning was the word, as if the universe began with a hollow phrases, a single word that could sum up everything and from which everything could be understood and made whole, a highly condensed core of linguistic energy. Some linguists have argued that all languages come from a, a first language or a single source that was spoken by the Homo sapiens, but we may never know for sure if the Neanderthals spoke or not. I mean, most all explanations, whether scientific, religious, or linguistic just lead to further questions, or at least to a new vista from which to contemplate more mysteries, whether of the physical or spiritual world. What is sacred is not so much the words themselves, but what we can make of them. And what is evil is what we can destroy with them. Is it so strange to think that perhaps we can edit a soul? Maybe we can make it better stronger, more capable of tenderness and love rather than cruelty and hate. I would like to be able to say that my wide ranging education allowed me to be highly skilled at connecting with other people, but unfortunately that just isn't true. How will you ever advance in your career? My first wife kept asking me when you can't even figure out which department you belong in. I'm an explorer of the mind, I would tell her proudly, and there is no compass or star chart to guide my way. Well, I would settle for a little shopping trip to Des Moines or Peoria, she would say. It is true, not much to do in the one block downtown of Grinnell, Iowa, where I had my first job as assistant professor, but I was just too busy to take her to Chicago for the weekends, let alone be home for dinner as much as she preferred. After all, wasn't I providing for her in a way that my father never could for my mother? In three years, we were able to secure a mortgage on a, on a rambling old house on the edge of the cornfields. Wasn't that enough? My second wife uh, seemed glad to have married an associate professor with a steady job, but that didn't stop her from also having a steady boyfriend. He had thoughtfully visited her right before our wedding and politely made plans to see her again after our honeymoon. His good manners extended to moving to St. Paul just across from where we lived in Minneapolis and where unfortunately there was far too much for them to do together on the weekends. When I asked her why she cheated on me, she said, you've always loved your books more than you loved me. And once again, I ended up on the clearance table of marriage, a bit dog-eared and worse for the wear. So then, I eventually married another professor in a mid-sized college town, thinking our careers would put us more in sync. And the environment was just right. But she seemed less interested in our living happily ever after tenure together than in finding ways to humiliate me at every faculty meeting. Though she encouraged me to be more ambitious, it turned out she also thought I was not qualified to be the head of the science department because she expected to have that position herself. So I agreed to share it which was no better an idea than our getting married in the first place. It's hard for me to tell if my career got in the way of my finding love or if I just threw myself more and more into my work because my marriages just didn't work. Maybe a little of both. Each of my wives had the habit of saying exactly the opposite of what I expected or hoped. You'd think that because I was attuned to the music of many a universe of discourse, I could catch on faster. That a plethora of antonyms is hardly a sign of harmonious or healthy matrimony. Perhaps it would have been better if I had heeded Betty White and taken my chances as a participant on password and tried to do that to meet a spouse. <laughs> better yet, maybe I should have just married Betty White herself. Though no doubt, she would have divorced me too. 
Alas, there are no passwords to marital bliss. Much easier to think about the building blocks of matter and energy or how words shape our reality than why I couldn't make someone else happy. Just as money does not necessarily mean happiness, lately I've been wondering if solitude does not necessarily have to be a synonym for loneliness. But then there I am, back at the beginning, trying to understand it all. Thanks, Rafe. I know that wasn't easy for you to share with me. I learned a lot. So, a tragic comedy of a marital life, huh? I'm in pretty bad shape. No, you know yourself better than you realize. Just need to give yourself a chance to realize that and maybe to stop regretting and start loving the ones you can love. Well, you are probably right. Who? Your children, the ones who maybe need it the most. And then maybe also yourself. And you think I deserve it? <laughs> Absolutely, chum. Though you do your best not to show it. Thank you.